Strap yourself in. Wood were prohibited. Not available in the state of shock. <laughs> hey, everybody. Dan Schubert here on Drum Talk TV with Ricky Rocket. How you doing, man? Good. Yeah, nice thanks to so see much you. for letting us come up to your place. No, oh, you're on my turf now, yeah, man. Yeah, we love it. <laughs> All the way out here from Vegas at Ricky Rocket's place in California. It's beautiful out here. You know, I lived in Ventura in the hills of Ventura above the ocean for about 15 years. I love it. And I'll driving play. up here to your place, we were watching the grass flow on the hills. And now that I'm in Vegas, there's no grass out there. No, there's not. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of Vegasy weather today, though. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. warm. It's like 85 Warm and, and windy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, but it's beautiful up here. It brought Good. back a lot of memories and, you know, growing right up on. in the valley and hiking by the beach and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was cool. Ventura's pretty cool. Yeah, I loved it there. Yeah. So, let's start with the obvious. What is up with poison, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know... We haven't gone out this summer. We, mm -hmm. we opted to do a few um, corporate gigs that, are, in fact, the first one's coming up in two weeks. Um, and, uh, and then maybe some stuff in the fall. Cool. So that's kind of what's up right now. Brett's yeah. kind of busy, and right. I'm sure you've heard a few rumors about Tracy Guns and I yeah. flirting around. Is there something that. you can talk about? Well, we don't really, uh, no, not too much, okay. um, but uh, Guns and Rockets, I mean, you know, I how like cool, that. you know? Yeah. Um, so that might be something we will we'll have a little bit of fun with. Right. So we'll cool. see. I will keep you updated on okay, that. Okay, yeah, please do. You know yeah. you can come on and talk about it anytime you want. And, and well, here's the thing. It's yeah. an excuse to build another kit. There you go. <laughs> There's, do you even need an excuse? Uh, <laughs> Well, it is one, but you know. it helps me convince myself. That oh, well, there you go. Okay. And yeah, and my shop manager. Right. Well, what's cool about this for me is, as you're watching this, depending on when you're watching it, it's being filmed in the last days of April 2014, and we met a year ago from this past NAM. We met at NAM 2013. Right. I met you and Troy Lucetta both at the same time in your booth. Right. With okay. your drums and. Um, just beautiful stuff, and we're actually filming another segment for Sprockets and Cogs with Ricky right after this, all about his drum line. So jump over to our Sprockets and Cogs series and watch that. But, you know, we've been talking about it on and off. We saw each other at NAM, and our schedules didn't match up, and then we saw each other at the Ox and the Loon. You did a piece there with us about Keith's influence and the Who's influence. So this is cool to finally be doing both the interviews that we're doing today. I appreciate well, cool. it. Yeah, so I'm finally I'm part of uh, Brian Tishy's alumni now, yeah. I think, you know. I'm in the boys club, so I've done three Bonzo bashes and now the moon right. uh, thing. So um, that's four events I've done that's with him killer. now. So yeah, yeah. me, I'm kind of a regular Portnoy's, a, a regular mm -hmm. um, Chad Smith, Chad Smith's a, a regular. So you know we're all kind of like regulars on yeah. that. You know when we can do it, we do it. It's fun. Yeah. That's not a bad thing to be a regular for. No, what it's a great not. event. Yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh, I look at it as, because we're an educational platform and, and entertainment, edutainment, I look at Brian's events that way. They really are educational in a way because you're sure. going through someone's specific catalog and then you've got different drummers from different genres of music sort of expressing their influence mm -hmm. through that drummer's you know, catalog and, and band's catalog, which is really interesting. I think more... More of that will come out in the future, and there's a place for it for sure. Well, I, I, you know, it would be cool to do like a, a film or an hour special or mm -hmm. something like that, where it's like, you know, as we move through, you know, start at the 50s maybe, right. and the 60s, 70s, you know, go up and have different drummers' interpretations of yeah. classic songs that sort of define that era. That era, yeah. And uh, that might be a cool thing to do, you yeah. know. Who knows? You know, Brian's a smart guy, so who knows what he'll come up yeah. with. Cool, and we'll produce the film. It's perfect. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Let's do it. it. You can narrate and All right. play in it. Yes, there you I go. Have very good narration. You voice. do. You've got a radio voice. <laughs> <laughs> so, drumming. When did you start playing? How I started you? playing the drum kit when I was twelve. Although, uh, playing bongos and assorted other things that you could strike predated that, of right. course. Uh, my dad and I would listen to Santana records, and he'd oh. play trumpet, and uh, and I'd sit there and play percussion. And, wow! Um, so when I transitioned to drum kit, it was like, you know, the beats were different. It was like, you know, laying down a, a, a beat was different than 
playing percussion over top of something. Right. Plus, so, you're using all four limbs now, and exactly there's, there's yeah. that. Yeah. So, did was you transition kind of, easily? No, it was awkward for me at really? first. Yeah, I was playing just. I mean, it just. Uh, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it at first, and I was like, "Well, maybe I should just play percussion." <laughs> you know? Really? But at that time, it wasn't there. It wasn't that cool to play percussion. You know what right, I mean? Right. Um, you wouldn't needed to be a rock drummer. So, yeah. um, and oddly enough, one of the first songs I ever learned, my brother-in-law taught me, uh, was uh, a Who song, mm-hmm. and it was uh, um, Bab O'Reilly. So, mm-hmm. and I wanted to play that, and they, it was taken. It was taken. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, okay, no problem, you know. Yeah. Well, poison covered squeeze box, so that'd be an obvious one. So we'll right. do that one. Yeah, that was great. And kids are all right, you know, classic mm-hmm. mod yeah, tune. You know, yeah, exactly. it defined the mod era. Yeah, definitely era. defined that era of the Who, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you take lessons, or did you teach yourself how to play? I didn't. I took trumpet lessons, believe it or not, to play drums. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, why not? <laughs> Um, I thought I was going to be a trumpet player, you know, because mm-hmm. my dad did, and then I just realized I, you know, we only had one trumpet, so he'd play it and I'd play the percussion. Fine, right. I'm just like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. But I did for about a year, and I learned to yeah. read music fairly well. And uh, but then when I uh, transitioned to drums, I I learned Bab O'Reilly very quickly, mm-hmm. and I was only you know 12 years old, and here I am playing that song. And yeah. um, so I I just watched people a lot. Mm-hmm. I was a watcher. Yeah. I mean, I got my. I had an older sister, who was kind of hippie era right. chick, and she'd take me to all these concerts and uh, the Elvis Davis band and all these different bands. And I, I, you know, so I was lucky enough to see that uh, firsthand to see live drums, and yeah. it's different than when you see it on TV yes. or just hear it on record. It's yeah. you can feel it. You know what I yeah. mean? And it's just it. I. It's what I had to do. Um, one of the first bands I ever saw was Johnny Winter. Uh, I saw Ooh. Johnny Winter live, wow. and uh, I saw Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. Oh, really? And, yeah. Wow. And I mean, I had a great, <clears throat> great drummers and percussionists. And, yeah. Um, I was exposed to a lot of really good stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, what happened to me? I have no idea, but uh, <laughs> I had the right influence. No, uh, my mom was into Elvis and stuff. My sister was into, you know, the Grateful Dead and all that stuff. Yeah. And my dad was into to black music, quite honestly. Uh-huh. James Brown and San- well, not you know, Santana's not black music, but it's ethnic. In a, yeah, and he was um, into a lot of soul and stuff he was like into that. that the know? real R and B before R and B became whatever the hell they're calling R and B now. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. R&B stands for rhythm and blues. Right. I don't hear rhythm or blues in what they call R&B today, not for so the much. most part. Yeah, not it's, so much. Yeah. Right. When I yeah. think of R&B, I think of like a lot of stuff that was related to Motown in the early days when we right. were kids and stuff like that. You know, yeah. and it's just what they call R&B now. Just to me, isn't it's not either of those things. Right? Well, you know, a lot of the soul stuff, I didn't. You know, I like it more now. Mm-hmm. At the time, I didn't so much. He always had it on, uh, but it was the funk stuff that I liked. I liked mm-hmm. the, you know, and I liked the, the the James Brown stuff, which is soul, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it, it crossed over to funky as it got a little further along and right. and, and, it, and its evolvement. Um, but um, you know, it's it's funny how things will influence you and. All of a sudden, you'll like listen to it years later and go, "God, I love that." And it's yeah. like when you're a kid, you didn't. You're yeah, like, "That's yeah. terrible," you know. Yeah. Uh, or you know, I didn't think it was terrible, but I think I just got hit over the head with it so much. Yeah. I wanted my own stuff. Right. I wanted Johnny Winter. I wanted Deep Purple. I wanted Kiss. Yeah. I wanted you know all these things and you know something to call my own. Right. You know. Um, and I didn't want any of my sister's stuff, you know, ah, the hippie stuff, the Grateful Dead, I wanted Alice, you know. Yeah, and yeah. But now I listen back and I did a drum circle with Mickey Hart and, oh, wow. and I'm so glad that my sister made me listen to all those Grateful Dead records because I knew everything about the Grateful Dead, you yeah. know. I mean, not everything, but, you know, I was, uh, and I go, oh my God, these were great records and, uh, and he's an amazing player and, yeah. and, uh, um, experimental and I mean you know it's just you know sometimes when you get stuff shoved down your throat a little bit it's not always such a bad thing you yeah, know? yeah and uh, I like your perspective I've sort of experienced the same thing as time has gone on and I've as I've gotten older and stepped there's been that space in between what happened here and yeah. how I hear it again now it means something completely different right I was driving with Lori the other day and I put on 
something and as it started she says wow it sounds like the b-52s or something and i slowly lifted up the cd case and it was indeed the b-52s when that music came out there's no way you'd catch me listening to the b-52s right. then. <laughs> uh -huh. when warrant quiet riot poison great right great great white all those bands were kind of coming up i was playing in the same clubs and stuff but in a progressive rock band I was really stubborn about being in a progressive rock band, and I wasn't nearly as open-minded as I was about music now. Mm -hmm. Now I'm completely open-minded. And I really thought I was back then, but I just wasn't into anything that had to do with the new wave or any of that mm -hmm. stuff. Now I listen to the B-52s. I love that stuff. It's just so fun. Right. To, to listen fun. to, you sure. know, and yeah, and then when you hear one of your peers, like for me, when Getty Lee says, I really appreciate the stylings of the B-52s, well, maybe I better pull that out and listen to it again, you know? Yeah. So it's just, it's different as you get older and, and open your mind more. You, you know? know what? Music to me is, 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 you know, if you're honest about it, that's mm -hmm. what's so cool about it. That's, you know, it's like I, um, it, it's like if you look at fine art, for example, you know, what really d differentiates fine art? It's really if it comes from a personal place. That's yeah. what it is. You're not doing yeah. it for somebody else. You're doing it for you. Right. It's 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 you kind of have to do it. That is um, what you're, you're expressing where you come from. Mm -hmm. And it's like you know, if you look at the Ramones, for example, you know they should have happened and they did. Okay. Yeah. And they represented New York City at that point in time, for example. Right. That was the soundtrack. They couldn't do anything else. If they were doing anything else, it would have been insincere. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other uh, people. I mean, where I'm from uh, in Pennsylvania and just the way, uh, the, uh, you know, when Brett and I put this band together, I mean, what Poison did to me was very honest mm -hmm. you know what i mean we didn't yeah. make it up it's what we really love and wanted to do right? if i would have turned around and turned tail when nirvana came out and went okay i'm going to do that stuff now people would have went are you kidding me and and, and it would have been dishonest so right. I, I didn't try to do that and it has that you know, always been the spirit of not only your playing but the spirit of the material that poison has put out absolutely you know what we're a garage band I mean, we're a basement band. We started in a basement. Right. Everybody sets up and everyone starts riffing and, oh, that's cool. Let's do that. Hey, yeah. what if you did that three times? You know, I mean, you know after yeah. a while, you know, you, you have a song and then yeah. you sit down and you kind of write it out. Now it really is a song and then you fine tune it. You know, that that is a garage basement band mentality right. and we still operate like that. Did we, you, I, I'm sorry, I got to no, ask you, okay. did you guys know back then when you were creating that way, and your sound was literally developing organically, that it would literally, I don't know how else to say this, but it would fit a mold? You know what I not mean? Not at all, not at all. We didn't, you know, we did not overthink anything. Yeah. Our motto was always, you know, don't pick your audience, do your music and let your audience pick you. I love you. that. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, See, you know, I, I've done the same thing, and that's why we have four people watching Jump Talk TV. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, kids. <laughs> Half the kids. Uh, uh, no, there's five now. <laughs> yeah. One of the other kids came in the room. <laughs> um, That's really cool. And, and then as you started to achieve some success doing that same sort of music and, you know, uh, carrying on with that same spirit, did you guys realize... I'm sorry about that. No, nah, that's okay. Did you realize, wow, look what we've slipped into? Or I mean, it's almost like an archetype sort of situation, the way your music is what it is and how it fits a genre. It is mm -hmm. the face of a genre in some ways, I think. I, I think so too. I think that uh, that we had a, a social impact, Yeah. okay, for better or for worse. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, I think that that's what made poison important. And when I say poison's important, I'm not saying I'm important, okay? I'm just, was, I, it, I was lucky that, yeah. enough to be an ingredient in something that became important. Yeah. And I want to make that distinction. Um, I, I'm not that self-absorbed, <laughs> but I think that w we've definitely filled a gap at that point in time. Right. We, you know, uh, I think rock was a little bit in flux. Okay, when mm -hmm. we came out to the West Coast, when uh, was this roughly? Just to give youngsters context. Um, eighty-four okay. ish, eighty-five. Right. Um, you know, they didn't want to sign any more bands like Motley Crue or anything like right. that. And uh, we're like, well, that's good because we're not Motley Crue, but they. Everybody thought the industry was going to go super heavy, and they were signing a lot of really, really heavy bands at that mm -hmm. time. Um, but it didn't go that way. Um, 
and you know it was more you know as you you know as we found more arena rock you know what i mean yeah. uh, more pop rock mm -hmm. which is what we were you know we're hard rock pop rock we are a hard pop rock band if that mm -hmm. makes any sense yeah absolutely um and there wasn't really a mold for it mm -hmm. uh i don't think capital record ra blah, let me try that in english i don't think capital records knew what to do with us at first they had us doing stuff that iron maiden would be doing and they had us doing stuff that duran duran would be doing because that would that you know, that's you their mean, bands, When you okay? say doing, you mean the types of shows, shows and things yes. you were associated with, the way yeah. you were billed with other groups and things. Exactly. Okay. We'd be doing some super heavy festival, and then, you know, uh, and then the next time we'd be doing something with, like, Spandau Ballet or something. Wow. <laughs> we actually played with Duran Duran once. It was like they didn't know what to do with us. But we knew what we wanted. We were just like this, you know, hard rocking. Aerosmithy kind of you know band with like this over the top image you know what I mean yeah. and um, we knew what we wanted and we were having a really good time with it and you know mm -hmm. we were drawing our influences from a lot of the glitter era right. uh, that we grew up with and Van Halen and the mm -hmm. arena rock you know we right. we had it all kind of and even stuff like Leonard Skinner I mean we all grew up with Southern rock too mm -hmm. you know and I think in in riffs like uh, on Skinny Bop, you can hear that sort of, you know, picky sort yeah. of stuff and yeah. a little swing to it and that kind of stuff. You know, so, yeah, it, I think we, def uh, I think we, you know, sort of, you know, here's this huge category that everyone loves to fit us in, but at the time we defied any category. Yeah. You know, you what sort I mean? of carved your own path, and the record company sort of bounced you off the trees along they the did. way. They did, they and they did some weird stuff, and and a lot of times we didn't like it. You know, it'd be like, hey, we all dressed up like poison, and let's all take pictures together, and that girl looks like you, and they wanted to pigeonhole. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, well, that's kind of how I look. Typecast. Yeah. I was yeah. like, oh, I look like that like six, eight months ago. I kind of already changed already. You know, right. it yeah. was that kind of stuff. But, you know, um, but it is what it is. And I always tell people, be careful about what you do on your first record because you're going to answer for it the rest of your life. I was going to, and that leads to my next question. After that point, how much were you guys able to maintain artistic control and still do things the way you wanted, even though good were question. kind of pigeonholing you? You know what? Good question. Actually, we maintained a lot of control for the first three albums because um, we were still, you know, we started on an independent label, which was Enigma. Mm -hmm. And when we got our deal with Capital, Enigma became the A&R department for right. Capital yeah. insofar as Poison and uh, the Smithereens and a couple other acts. Right. And uh, so it's we answered to Enigma, who signed us for what we were at the time. At the time, right. yeah. It just when Capital <clears throat> would get a hold of, they go, "No, wait a minute. If you're going to do this video, can we do this?" And we had massive fights with Capital about how the artistic concepts. design and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, Talk Dirty Me was almost a revolt because it was like you know, uh, you know, you have to have. There was all these ingredients that you had to have in a video, mm -hmm. okay? And one of those things were, you know, if you're going to wear that shirt, you got to wear it the whole time, and you have to, you know, all this kind of stuff. If you watch the Talk Dirty Me video, we don't wear the same thing at all in the whole darn thing. We keep changing. From one we're cut just, to the next. We threw yeah. everything. We're like, let's bring the crew in. Oops, there's an accident. Let's have the director in there. I mean, we brought, we made it a big party. Yeah. I knew we did, we did the right thing with the Talk Dirty Me video. Right when uh, several years later, and uh, I was told never to name drop, okay, but I'm gonna really drop one, okay. I had the chance to meet Michael Jackson, and one of the first things he said to me was, he goes, I love that video because you guys are having so much fun. It's my favorite oh, video on TV sweet. right now. Wow. And I was like, you know, he's watching, he was paying attention to stuff, you know, and uh, that That's was a great. huge compliment. Sure. He was a king of pop, yeah. loving Talk Dirty to me. Yeah, if I could only cool got it to say it in an interview, it would have been really yeah. great. But uh, and, and, <laughs> and by the way, Paul McCartney told me that Elvis taught him never to name drop. <laughs> <laughs> told me the same thing. <laughs> no, but that's really cool. I mean, Michael definitely liked many different genres of music. And I think it's partly how he how and why he was able to create the way he did. Absolutely, you know? yeah. yeah. So that's a huge compliment. What a neat thing to have heard. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much stuff eclipses that how talented he was. You know, people get so wrapped up in the all the hoopla about him right. that, uh, you know, they, they forget, 
what an incredibly talented person he was. Yeah. Um, and uh, God rest his soul, you know. Uh, I was sad the day he died. Oh, I was on yeah. the tour bus sitting there all day just going, wow, this really happened. Yeah, I'll never you forget know? that either. I remember my daughter running into the room where I was with one of my sons. And uh, she said, I just heard that Michael Jackson died. And my son Alex and I looked at each other like, like, why would that not be possible? But it felt like, how could that be possible? You yeah, know what I mean? right. Yeah. You know, just so young and as far as we knew, he wasn't ill. You know, just all those things. And it was just so, like, surreal at, at the time. But, yeah. yeah, he was a musical genius. Like his music or not, he was a musical genius. And you know you what? Know? Those two words get put together way too often these days. That's true. Uh, and, and when somebody really deserves it, it's, they really deserve it. Yeah. But, you know, I mean... I'm glad Michael Jackson was as over the top as he was. Uh, I mean, it, you know, and fed into that whole media thing. I mean, in some way, a lot of people think it's a shame. I think that popular music, okay, mm -hmm. and this is what drives me crazy about certain kinds of rock. Is there's so many friggin' rules. Yeah. Oh, well, if, if, if you, you can't wear that, you can't, no, 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 you can't do that. I said, you can't do that. This is music that you can get your freak flag on, okay? Yeah. And the and since it stopped being that mm -hmm. a few years back, mm -hmm. uh, this is why rap is now the dangerous music and rock and roll isn't. Interesting. Because I think that it has stopped becoming that dangerous thing. Because danger isn't just right. That's not that's not dangerous. That's right. a, it's an that's an easy way to 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 be aggressive. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, one of the, you know, I, I think the last real rock star was Marilyn Manson, you mm. know, to really yeah. stick it out on his sleeve, everything yeah. he had, yeah. and risk that ridicule. Yeah. And to me, it's the risk that really makes you brave. And that's when you it know? is from yeah. here, like you were saying. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Adam Lambert going out there and saying, hey, I'm gay and I'm going to sing for Queen now. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of risk in that. Yeah. He risked that. And didn't win because of it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yet he got the Queen gig. I don't remember who yeah. the guy was that won the thing. Do you? No. Uh, no, you I don't know? remember him so, though. So it's the real risk people, yeah. that, whatever it is that they're risking, right. uh, that, that really, I mean, and this is what Poison did. We, we were very risky. We, we took yeah. a huge chance, you know. Right. Um, we, we didn't go halfway. We didn't like... Well, let's make our hair a little bit puffed up and a little tone the image down. We went <laughs> now. Yeah. We're going for it, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, fuck us or fight us. Yeah, Here we that are. Thing was yeah. pumped up all the way. For yeah. Sure. And that, I think, that factor of risks is directly proportionate to how sincere you are about what you do in your music. Otherwise, right? What are you risking? You know. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Tracy Guns and I were just talking about this. Everything stems from your attitude. Whatever your attitude is, is determines what you play, how you play it, what you look like, what you say, what, you know, uh, the stuff you design for your logo, whatever it is, yeah. it all comes from that right. one little place first. Yeah. And then it's you expressed know? through all right. those things. Yeah. But a lot of times people pick it out of here and then they try to put the rest of it together over here and it just right. doesn't quite work so well, you know. Right. Um, so I like it. I like to see bands and artists come out that are really have that risk factor in rock and roll, right. I think. And it doesn't mean that there isn't a place for people that are just genuine musicians that are just players. They want to play. They want to challenge themselves. Uh, I think that's awesome, too. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think there's room for all of it in the world, yeah. you know. And that's why we have so many different kinds of drums, so many different kinds of setups, so many yeah. different kinds of TV shows and magazines and... Uh, there's everything you want is out there. You don't have yeah. an excuse. You can just d go out and dig in and, and you find know what, what you like. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Having said all that, and knowing that you've played in the Bonzo Bashes and the Ox and Loon, obviously John Bonham, Keith Moon were influences. You mentioned Van Halen, Alex Van Halen, definitely an influence. Who are some influences, Ricky, that might surprise people that are watching this? That they wouldn't... Because you know how we all get... Pigeonhole. You figure, sure. okay, Nico yeah. McBrain, Iron Maiden, yeah, right. his influences must be X, Y, Z. And it's not nearly always the case. Right. How right. about for you? Who would be some influences that would make people go, whoa, really? There's a lot of lesser known guys, mm -hmm. you know, that... Like me. That are, yeah. <laughs> Big influence here. By, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
you know, all the guys that played with Johnny Winter because I got, you know, yeah. that was my first concert. I started listening to all that stuff. Ian Pace from Deep Purple. Oh, huge, yeah. Huge influence. One of my biggest. Absolutely. Some of the yeah. lesser known guys like Dinky Diamond from Sparks. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. there was the band Sparks. The first time I saw him, I'm like, God, this guy's brilliant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Clem Burke from Blondie. Oh, One yeah. of my favorite hard to hitters. Yeah. Tommy Price from Billy Idol. Yeah. And Joan Jett. He's, I love the way that guy plays. I yeah. can't play like him. He has murdered more drums than, you know, than I've built, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and does it with finesse. I don't know how that happens. Um, God, you know, I mean, uh, there are, you know, a, a, a bunch of dinky little bands that I used to go see all the time, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And uh, I like Jimmy Chocolate from Kicks, you know. Oh, yeah. Straight ahead meat and potatoes guy that just yeah. makes that band work, you know. Yeah. I always loved the way, the way he played. You know, I like a lot of simple feel guys, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, I love um, Billy Cobham and mm -hmm. you know, the Return to Forever band. Oh, great. Lenny White. White. Lenny White. White. I, yeah. mean, I had the chance to have dinner with him one oh, night. Oh, wow, that's great. He was really cool. He yeah. was a great guy. I saw him with Return to Forever for like my 19th or 20th birthday. So this was, this was a long time ago. And uh, it, it, I was always a fan of their music since like the mid-70s, but to see them do that live was unreal. It was great. Really well, cool. I, uh, I I went through that a phase where I was into all that stuff, yeah. Al Demiola and, uh -huh. and Stanley Clark and all that kind of stuff, and I'd listen to those records and the Dixie Dregs, you yeah. know, and uh, Rod Morgenstein's yeah. amazing. And, yeah. uh, what a cool guy. A yeah. Great educator. Oh, yeah. I mean, just... Yeah, from... From Dixie Dregs to Winger to teaching at Berkeley. I mean, yeah. dude's pretty well rounded. Yeah, he is. He is. And you got to check out, if you're a Billy Cobham fan, you got to check out, and you got to check out my interview with Billy on Trump Talk TV. Oh, cool. Did that uh, at the Tama 40th anniversary. Um, Party. Oh, that's right. He's a Tama guy. Yeah. Well, yeah. he was years he was, okay. ago. Years ago. He was a Fives guy, too, by yeah, the way. Yeah, Fives first, yeah. then Tama. And he's been with Yamaha for years, but Tama asked him to come and perform at this thing. And we mm. interviewed him afterwards, and he had some really insightful stuff. He was, yeah. yeah. Oh, he's a brilliant out. guy. Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, he's... Uh... And he's open-handed, just like Lenny White, mm -hmm. and has his drums in all sorts of different... You can't make heads or tails of the order yeah. of his drums. It's right. really bizarre, which is cool. Yeah, I like Alan White. Um, oh, from yeah. yes. Um, yeah, I mean, there's gosh, so many guys. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, I really do appreciate. I mean, I drummers are, are are the ones that I appreciate when I listen to music. You know, yeah. uh, because that's what I do. But it's what drew me to to music are, right. are drums. It wasn't music, and then I got drums out of it. It was kind of drums took me to music yeah, sort of that's cool um, that's cool and uh just because i you know i was always playing around on stuff although my sister locked me in my bedroom one time uh this is an interesting story that was and i thank her for this uh she wanted the party okay she was nine years older than me and babysitting for her little brother was nothing more than a pain in the ass he was okay. 19 when this happened <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So me and my friend Dave, you know, we got, we got into trouble doing something, but it was a little bit of trouble, but she yeah. made it big so that yeah. she could send me to my room right. so she could party. Right. And she goes, and she must have felt bad because she's like, here's some records and here's my record player. Oh. And locked the door. And it was eight days a week and paperback writer and oh, all wow. these 45s. And that's what I listened to and I started playing along to oh, it. Oh, cool. And that was a poignant moment in my life that yeah. night. It changed. Wow. And uh, you immersed uh, yourself in I all did. stuff you weren't really familiar with, right? Yeah. Which I think all musicians should do. I think all musicians, not just drummers, but should listen to stuff that they're averse to or that they've never really touched on. Well, I, I love the Beatles, by the way. And, and, you know, but but it was that was my sister's music, but it was kind of like that interim kind of thing. Yeah. It was like, okay, that connects us. Yeah. And that's one thing the Beatles did. Do, uh, their music does this to everybody. Yeah. It connects generations. Yes. It's kind of crazy, isn't You're it? right, though. And, and it works with the Stones, too, you know. Yeah. But the Beatles, it really works. Holy crap, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, I've never... I mean, people can say whatever they want about Ringo. Come on. I mean, you remember yeah. his fills from... Try to know? play it. 
Yeah. You know? There's so much space, and it's hard to keep time that well. It's Nick weird. Mason is the same way. I say it all the time. That uh-huh. They're two of the hardest drummers to emulate, and they take about the most crap as any drummers could. Yeah. I just don't understand that. Oh, I take a lot, too. <laughs> Not about your drumming, though. Oh, I have. I let's have. let's but, talk about you know. some other crap that you take. This is a Ricky Rocket fun fact. What was that? <laughs> We're at 30? Okay. Ricky Rocket fun fact. We were talking on the phone yesterday. You just got back, gotten back from Brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah. lessons. Talk about that. God, that's, you know, I've always liked the martial arts. When we lived in downtown LA, um, our band, mm-hmm. um, I got uh, a knife pulled on me and uh, I got out of it. Uh, but I thought I was going to die that night. Really? And I always uh, said, you know, when I have some money, I'm going to learn how to defend against a knife, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to learn uh, martial arts. So when I did get some money, I found a teacher named Cass Magda that taught me, he did the JKD stuff, which is Bruce Lee's stuff, mm-hmm. and Filipino knife fighting. Oh. And through that, I started to get into the sea lot, which comes from Indonesia. Mm-hmm. It's more of a ground fighting stuff. And I said, this is cool because I wrestled in school. Oh. And then I met John Jock Machado, who was... Uh, here from Brazil teaching Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And that helps because you're married. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Um, And, you know, at that time, Hoist Gracie was doing well in the uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship. He was Mm -hmm. beating everybody. He was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy. And those families came over together, the Machado brothers and the Gracies came over. The Gracies doing the MMA stuff and the Machado brothers uh, going more for the sport jiu-jitsu. And uh, so I went and took a class, and I got tapped out like 12 times, you know. I thought I'd do great. Next day, I signed up, and that was 16 years ago. Wow, really? I didn't have any idea you were in it that long. That's great. Yeah, I've been in a long time. So, and it's been, uh, I'm a second-degree black belt um, Mm -hmm. under Hanato Magno Mm -hmm. in uh, Santa Monica. It's a little bit of a hike, but that's where my team is, and... I've competed once, and I help other people get ready for competitions. I'm a little bit old, but, but uh, and I could, you know, because of the poison schedule, I never know. You yeah. know what I mean? A lot of stuff happens in the summer, and we usually tour in the summer. Yeah. This year, I don't have an excuse. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's something that, uh, you know, I can't, it's hard to um, sort of, uh, at this point in time, really, um, understand myself without jiu-jitsu anymore That's you know what really i mean cool. you know i think that uh in general not as a blanket rule because there never is one but in general i think drummers are more sporting they're more fit they're more fit conscious to some degree and more active i think i mean it comes with the territory of what we do yeah um how does. has it helped your playing your stamina and how has it helped you up here because i know that martial arts from a little bit of my experience with qigong that it can really help you up here, too. Well, you know, Bruce Lee said something one time. He said, you know, to find your true spiritual self, you must first step through the physical door. And, you know, uh, something does happen when you challenge yourself physically. Right. It mentally makes you focus differently. And, Correct, uh, yeah. Uh, and martial arts definitely does that because it's a constant challenge. You know, you're always there's always somebody better. There's always yeah. a better technique. There's always a technique that you want to get rid of because that's not working. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a, a lot to it. Um, so, I mean, as far as drumming, you know, again, like I said, it's hard for me to understand myself without it now. Yeah. So, uh, to, to become introspective about it, and it's not like I switch on the light switch now, and this is how I am as a drummer with it, and right. I turn it off, and this is how I'm a drummer without it. I don't know. Right, because it's know? been so long. Yes, yeah. it's, it's been so long. So, But I do think that I'm, you know, at 52 years old, it's, you know, uh, I probably wouldn't be doing as well without it you know i mean i guess i could just go to the gym or something and actually you know what yoga is great uh yeah. there's a, a yoga for fighters program too uh-huh. and uh that i think is great for drummers because, absolutely you know, i was gonna say we're the same age i'm 51 okay and i notice when i play i do you're what younger a little bit just a little. <laughs> I, i've learned what helps my stamina a lot is i have noticed and this wasn't a conscious decision i just sort of noticed over time that I use yogic breathing while I'm playing. I'm never huffing and puffing while I'm playing. It's just more of a, a steady, no matter what my body's doing, right. how active or how calm, 
my breathing is always just kind of calm like this. And I think that's really helped me. Absolutely. I just yeah. hardly ever get winded. And yeah, it's certainly you need to not teach that, I man. Yeah, yeah, I think it's very helpful. Well, that definitely happens in, in jiu-jitsu. I mean, jiu-jitsu is a ground game uh, for the most part. We have mm -hmm. some stand-up, and we have a stand-up teacher. We have Boom Boom Mancini, the boxer. Right. Uh, wow. So we get a, a lot of uh, great rounded stuff over there. And we have an MMA coach, um, Rico Ciparelli. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, it, it's, you know, when you've got a 230-pound guy on top of you bent on choking you out, you better figure out how to breathe because you're either going to get out or you're going to get tapped out. Yeah. One of the two is going to happen. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's okay in there because you can tap and you can get out of it. And the only thing that is your, that's hurt is your ego. But if you're on the street and that's happening, yeah. you know, um, now it could be life or death, right. you know. Right. And it's, it's different when somebody's for real bent on your destruction yeah. than when you're simulating battle. Yeah. Because uh, no one really wants to hurt each other. Right. Well, yeah. we trust each other. I yeah. mean, you know, you know, you're doing a cross choke, and it's like, I could kill you. And yeah. you're trusting the guy not to kill you. Right. That's why I think there's that brotherhood. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I'll go anywhere in the United States. There's another jiu-jitsu guy, and it's like, you know, you don't mind saying, hey. But, I mean, you feel connected right away. Yeah. And I think it's even more than, like, the kickboxing and stuff, because all that's back here. You know what I mean? You're yeah. Touching, you know. Yeah. Uh, but but with jujitsu, it's up close and personal. That's you know, right you're, yeah. you know, you're in it all the way. But you know, most fights get there anyway, so yeah. we just accelerate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Skip the the uh, the formality. The foreplay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the foreplay sounds funny, but yeah, all right. <laughs> cool. Thanks for sharing that with us. I think it's important that. A, people get to know a little bit more about our artists other than what they are known for. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of helpful information. With what you just and I'm a daddy. You and know? you're a daddy, I'm a yeah. daddy, yeah. I know what that's like. I'm married with children. Yeah. <laughs> and your kids are quite young. They are. Five, almost five and a year. Yeah. Lucy's only 14 months, so. Yeah, she's just. How do you hero. like this phase of your life? It's crazy. Yeah. It's, uh, I like it. I mean, uh, it's like. It goes away when they're in their 30s, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> sort of goes away. I started late, you know, because yeah. I've spent my life touring yeah. and making videos and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah I have grandkids older than yours or, and around the same age. Yeah. God, that's crazy. Ooh, it is yeah. crazy. Yeah. My kids are older than me now. <laughs> and I make sure they know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, though. Being a dad's just the best thing in the world. It is. Yeah. It is. It is. My, You know, I didn't... I didn't know what it would be like to have a little girl. I loved having a little boy. Okay. Mm -hmm. He came first and it's like he's my boy. Yeah. You know, we ride motorcycles, we do he goes to jujitsu sometimes. Um, I had a little girl. I'm like, what am I gonna do with a little girl? Oh my god, I don't know what to do. I mean I of course I wasn't gonna tell my wife this, but I'm just <laughs> thinking to myself, I'm petrified. I really what, what am I gonna do with a little girl? Yeah. And I tell you, I mean, it's from easy. The you minute play she drums. opens her eyes, yeah, right. she does play drum. Great. It's from the minute she opens her eyes in the morning till the time she goes to bed, I'm just like in awe oh, of her. You know, that's just so smitten. Sweet. Like it's like, yeah. I endear her so much. It's like yeah. you know, and she gets a shot or a vaccination. It's like, oh, with my boy, it'd be like, it's okay, buddy. Yeah. What's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> but with her, it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know. I had to drop her off today, and uh, she just kept holding on, holding on. I was like, okay, I'm here for about another half hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so, so cool. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for joining us here well, on Drum Talk TV again. Again. Really appreciate thanks it. for having me. Oh, I feel like pleasure. a regular. Yeah, for sure. And <laughs> if you want to feel like an irregular, watch for Ricky's other episode on our Sprockets and Cogs series where he talks all about Rocket. Drumworks right here on www.drumtalktv.com. We'll see you soon.